Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Soft Talk Apple Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Torrance. Today, I want to take you back to November 1981, and we'll sit down and talk to Doug Carlston of Bruderbund Software. So I want to take you back to November 1981 in Soft Talk magazine, and you can see in the cover we've got an article about apples being used in the Forest Service. It's Exic Bruderbund, which we'll talk about later, and then other interesting articles on using apples in the field of psychology, as well as some reviews of RAM cards that were available at the time. So opening it up, we have the usual full page ad for Ultima and then looking at the table of contents uh, you can see here the publisher Al Tomrovic, editor is Margot Comstock Tomrovic. Uh, the art director is Kurt Walner who went on to actually do all of the design for the assembly lines book and just continuing on here's our contest for November 1981 so we have a design your own software package so you had to try and design a package using either Apple II graphics or just hand-drawn for uh, a fun software package. Moving along, uh, we can see some of the artwork at the time. So contrasting the Ultima full page full color ad there. So here we have a ad for Qtext, which is a word processing program and you can see the nice hand drawn artwork there. So definitely a big difference between some of the artwork in the advertisements. There is a letter to the editor. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, so here's Here's a couple letters to the editor about the use of sex in advertising in soft talk and they're actually complaining about the previous art, um, one of the previous issues in September on page 68 and if we go back to page 68 sure enough we have our advertisement for soft porn and you can clearly see why this might be uh, offensive to readers of the day um, and especially saying how this is not good for portraying women in computer science industry and if we just go on a few more pages in this one then we come to this interesting uh, advertisement so High Res Secrets by Don Fudge. If you can't budget, fudge it. I'm not quite sure what what purpose this woman serves here in the advertisement. I don't know if she's uh, part of the High Res Secrets or not, but clearly there was an amateur attempt here to use images to enhance the desirability of the product. But uh, I think this definitely falls under the category of kind of dubious advertising. So next, uh, here is... Roger Wagner's assembly line. So this was article number 14. And in this one, he's actually talking about how to do disk access from assembly language. So he's got a program here to do a B load and a B save. And that goes on. Here's an advertisement for his Merlin assembler. So it's nice how Softalk actually would embed, a lot of times they would embed the advertisement for a software product right in with the author's article so that you could look at one and immediately be interested in the software product. And then here's an advertisement for Assembly Lines the Book which is coming out soon and they're saying that it's going to be in high demand so you should order your copy ahead of time. And then finally we get to the Exec Bruderbund article and this was interesting because this was in 
November 1981, and Bruderbund had really just gotten their their big break about 11 months before with the publication of Apple Galaxian, which they got from StarCraft in Japan. And so they're really on the rise here. And But you can see the company's still pretty small. They only have a few employees. And to get the perspective on this, we're actually going to switch now and we're going to talk to Doug Carlston and he'll tell us all about what it was like to design software back in the day and how things have changed over the years. All right, so I'm sitting here with Doug Carlston of Brutal One Software and I, I'm going to talk to him about the soft talk article on exec bruder bund which was in november of 1981 and so doug why don't you just maybe give a little introduction to yourself and uh, tell us about the company that you helped to found sure um my brother gary and i started the company when we were living in eugene oregon in february of 1980. Um, i had been an attorney before then but I had paid for a lot of my college education by programming at the local computer center, a skill that I learned in the early 60s at a summer course at Northwestern University in the Midwest. Um, we, uh, we decided in, I think, August of 1981, about two months before this magazine article came out, to move our operation from Eugene down to the Bay Area because we were getting fogged in a lot. We couldn't get our, our shipments out. And it was very early days, and we very much were living a hand-to-mouth existence. We, we sent all of our packages out COD, and we needed the money from those to pay our bills. And although by 1981, we were already um, well on our way to our first million dollar a year. So it, it, it took off like a rocket. Um, that didn't mean there was any money in the bank. That, it just <laughs> It just meant that you know we were running fast to stay uh, ahead of the game. SoftTalk played a very important role in our company's uh, success. In uh, the first months of our company, we had no idea how to get distribution. There was no organized distribution. There were a few chains, Computerland and a couple of others. And um, so we drove around the country. I drove once around the country, and I have the... Uh, I have the sales ability of a, a mugwort, uh, but a lot of computer stores at that point had computers sitting around and the owners were in the back playing with their computers and paying no attention and nobody was in the stores. And the computers typically were turned on and there was just a little carrot s symbol uh, on the screen because they had nothing to play. And I had written a, a bunch of software. Uh, originally it was mostly legal software for my law office. But games are also a good way to exercise your programming skill. And so I wanted to use all the capabilities of the Apple II and the TRS-80, which were the two computers that we had at the time. And um, so I ended up writing a couple of little simulations called the Galactic Saga. And we came in, in February of 1980 to um, the West Coast Computer Fair and met a trader from Japan who had some Apple II programs, but had, didn't own an Apple II. So in order to display his wares, we let him use one of our computers and show them on our at our booth. His software attracted a lot more attention than my software, <laughs> and so we asked him if we could have a distribution arrangement and sell his product uh, here, which we did. And those products were some of our initial big successes. It also turned out that we learned a lot about intellectual property because they were rips of coin-op games in Japan, although we had never seen them in the United States. Um, and years later, uh, when Atari bought those rights for the U.S., we had a very nice conversation and were given a certain amount of time to close out our inventory and so on. But to be fair, Atari was very gentle with us. The lawyer who did it was a guy named Angelo Pisani. And I think they were very interested in having us be supportive of their hardware. So they, they gave us an appropriate notice because they had to protect their intellectual rights, but they were not hard on us. Um, Al uh, and Margo um, uh, Tomrovic were important to us because they have a poll in the back of the magazine that shows the best-selling products for the previous month, I think, the top 30 right here. 
And um, they also had a little editorial that goes with it. And they would mention, like in this particular one, uh, we have Apple Panic at number three, and we'd see how you know how many products we would get in the top thirty. And it got to be fun. Snoggle at number twelve, and I don't know that might be it. It looks like that's about it. Um, and the purpose uh, of this was just to let people know what was out there. They mentioned that we had some products in the in the bestseller list, although most of the people they called asked what was selling had never heard of us. We had terrible distribution. And of course, moments after that article came out, we started getting calls from distributors and dealers all around the country. It made a huge difference to us. We went from um, monthly revenues of five to ten thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars that December. And it was mostly attributable to uh, to these guys. Yeah. And was that Galaxian was the, the I think it was Apple, game Apple that? Galaxian was the first big seller. Okay. Um, the interest was high enough in that that uh, when when uh, Bob Leff and Rod, uh, what was his part, Roger Wagman? No, Dave Wagman. Dave mm-hmm. Wagman um, started Soft Cell, which later became Maricel, the first big distributor of software. Um, they called us and said, we need 5,000 of these. And we said, we don't have enough money to buy 5,000 discs. And they said, we'll send you the discs if you'll send them all back once you've recorded them. So that's, we actually did that. And uh, that um, we got them done, I think, on December 1st. So they had three weeks before Christmas to sell them. And that was enough time back then. They, they were very fast, and we were very fast. I remember going to visit them in 1981 without telling them. We were just down visiting Soft Talk, and they were in LA. And we stopped by just on a whim on a Sunday night. We were going by where their offices were. It was near the airport, and we were on our way, I think, to the airport. And they were hard at work in there with 20 people or so, uh, uh, working around the clock, trying to get as much stuff out as they could. <laughs> and I looked at that and said, they're gonna do just fine. You know, They work all the time, and they did, they did. Yeah. Um, so again, SoftSell was important. It created a community out of the Apple II users in a way we were never able to do with the TRS-80. They had a, con- a kind of a closed distribution system that Tandy wanted to control. They were very inaccessible. We never did get our products into their stores. And eventually we just didn't carry any more uh, of their product. We did Apple II and then I think in 81 we started adding other lines, Atari and Commodore and, and right. so forth. But uh, Apple, uh, Apple Talk, Soft Talk was was really sort of the the, the heart of the community um, at the time, and it kept us all connected with one another. Yeah, and, and it's interesting what you were saying about the you know like having the the five thousand discs shipped to you, and they just sort of did that on credit. And I think it, it seemed like that was pretty common back then, where there was like a lot of trust in the industry, and you just kind of trusted people and. Um, it was more like a, a, a community, it seems like, and so I don't know. Maybe well, people can... weren't really businessmen. I, mm-hmm. I don't think any of us had any particular business background at that point. These were enthusiasts, and I don't think anybody thought that was particularly strange or unusual. There wasn't a sense that it was a great deal of trust. And the truth was, we partied together. We got, we did vacations together. We didn't view one another as competitors. We um, we set up a rafting trip with Sierra Online. Um, in 81 or 82 that I think 75 people joined. We started in 83, we started an association of software publishers and we would get five, 600 people together. Later it became five or 600 companies that would get together a couple times a year, sometimes more often. We had trade shows, first the West Coast Computer uh, Fair where we often got to know one another uh, and met and later Comdex and CES and, and uh, I think E squared came along later. CES is still, I think, one of the biggest ones out there. Um, and so it was very much a, a there was sort of a mutual sense of um, excitement at how this hobby was suddenly turning into a livelihood for yeah. all kinds of people. Yeah. And obviously, some people did well, and some people foundered and, and lost their way. But I think that's likely to be true in any industry. Right. So. So it, it looked like, you know, back in, what was this, November 81, how, how big was the company then? It, you know, and I guess another question is, it seemed like you tended to get a lot of developers, like game developers who would come to you with the game, 
as opposed to having kind of your own um, like permanent staff, I suppose, of, of programmers. And yeah, most most people had a publishing model mm -hmm. back then. Electronic Arts did too. In fact, yeah. we we uh, Sierra Online did. We competed for the for the people we advertised for games, and we might find one of our ads in there saying we're looking for software and so forth. We would evaluate it. You try to evaluate it with minute within minutes of getting the submission because. If you call and got a busy signal, it meant one of your competitors was talking to them about signing up their game. And we, we had people who went back and forth between us and other publishers. You know, whoever got there first, you know, would get the deal. Yeah. Um, and that was just the nature of it. We did, um, I did develop some software, but it got, it got busy. And we had a few people who started on the outside but wanted to, you know, work next to their publisher and we would make office space available for them. And in fact, when we came down from Oregon in August of 81, right before this article was written, uh, five of us came down. The three Carlstons right here, and then uh, uh, Brian Ehler, who was our first employee up there, and uh, Chris Jacobson, who never was an employee, but was one of our first programmers. And he was from, I think, the Portland area and just came down with us at the same time. And right hung around and like many programmers when he didn't have an idea for a product or a game we had ports and other work for him to do and and they were mostly royalty based so if for example somebody didn't know how to program on the PC and we wanted a PC version of something Chris might say well I'll do that and then they would do a royalty split between them yeah so that was a very normal kind of thing yeah and then speaking of um, Chris uh, Jockumson, I just oh, track I have attack. track attack here, and, yeah. and I don't know. Whoop! There's the disc from it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you recall like what what was the motivation for doing that, or where where did that come out of? And you know, I I loved this game as a kid, but I don't think it probably sold that. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. It, I never heard of anyone else who had it, but um, you know, they sold well enough. I'm trying to remember back then. It, it might have sold, you know, five or ten thousand copies, uh -huh. but for Chris, you know, if that if it was a Twenty or thirty dollar game, and we would mean we would get maybe twelve dollars for it max, and he'd get a twenty percent royalty. He'd make two dollars and forty cents. That's suddenly twenty thousand dollars. A lot of these guys became millionaires in the next couple of years mm -hmm. with products. Track Attack was not a huge success, but but a number of the guys that were living and hanging around Choplifter and Load Runner both made a million dollars for the programmers and so on. So it kind of depended on which which one uh, it was. And it was enough, I'm, I think, to make uh, Chris happy about staying in the business. And yeah. We never knew. Um, if it was competently coded and a reasonable game, we would say yes, especially if he was sort of part of our community like that. Right, right. So. And then... Um it's funny, I also brought a copy of the arcade machine too, oh, which Chris and I did that together. Yeah, yeah. and I, I was actually gonna ask you about that. Like what was the what was the split on that between between the two of you? Oh, I like, think it was mostly Chris. Um, because uh, I designed it, but Chris did most of the coding on it and at the time that seemed like a more important thing. And this was a this was actually fun. This was a tool for making uh, arcade games and you could you could make a reasonably good arcade game using the tools in it and you didn't have to have any programming skill at all you had to have some sense of, of vi the visuals and so forth and uh, this was very successful this did very well for us and for him and we had competitions all around the country with prizes of Apple II computers and so forth if you if you uh, won I remember the first year um, and we asked Bill Budge I think among other people to be a, uh, a judge on these the winner was a um, a kid in New York City, uh, Hispanic, did not own a computer. He did it all at school, and um, he was the happiest camper in the world. This was his first computer, and he was just looking forward to getting it home and playing with it. So That's um, it was fun. We uh, we enjoyed it, and it was. Uh, I think it was the last thing I coded on uh, during the the time of Broadway. It was very hard to code when you were trying to run a company because yeah. you were in constant meetings and the phone's ringing and you can't really concentrate. Yeah. You, know, you really have to be able to isolate yeah. yourself and I couldn't do it. <laughs> so that's great. Well, there's a, that arcade machine, I used that a lot as a kid and uh, I actually just found one of my old games that I oh, had is made. That right? okay. But the sad thing was I was trying to copy it off of the floppy and I couldn't because it was copy protected itself. And yeah. 
because you, you did that to I think make the the person feel like they had created a real game, which I thought was so clever. But yeah, it, it it led to one uh, one uh, interesting thing. We we got contacted by the IRS because a number of people were claiming that they'd spent millions of devo- dollars developing products that were actually made with the arcade machine <laughs> and taking tax write-offs for R and D tax credits for it, and they wanted our test. Uh, testimony of what the average time and effort to make a game on this was, which is, well, you know, no. a couple hours, yeah, and, exactly. uh, something like that, yeah. uh, which is what they needed, I guess, to, to, <laughs> to win those cases. <laughs> That's great. So let's see, how long has it been here? About 35 years now, something? Yeah, something like that. Around there? About 35 years. So do you think, um, just is the industry, like the software, industry where you kind of thought it would be maybe 35 years later if you you know you probably weren't thinking too much about it back then no it's it's completely different uh and the the part that we were in is largely gone Mm -hmm. um it's gone because uh people had a, a certain amount of disposable time and the industry we were in mostly went to to people who went on the internet and used the internet for a wide variety of activities, but essentially chewed up their time. And another group that went off to the video game machines and plays games and things that are very much dedicated to machines. And we did we did video game machines early on, and I made a strategic error in the late 80s. Uh, um, I didn't like the fact that the cartridges um, that they came on then, it was, wasn't mm-hmm. yet uh, discs, uh, you could only buy from the hardware manufacturer, and they charged a price per unit so high that almost all the profit of the games that you developed went to them. Now it turned out as more manufacturers got into the business they had started competing against each other and that rapidly changed. But I sold um, I sold our division to um, some folks down in, in uh, Southern California because I, did, I thought it was it was kind of a trap. And to be fair, entertainment although um, uh, I think Bruderbund is known for a lot of its games, was a very small part of our business at that point. It was probably 5% of our revenue, maybe less. And part of that is because our most profitable products came from evergreen products, educational and productivity products. Print Shop was a half a billion dollar yeah. product in its lifetime. Um, Carmen was, although a game was really, ed- the education market sustained it. And it was about the same as Miss, probably 300 million, something like that. But the the regulars, Family Tree Maker, 3D Home Architect, were 40 or 50 million dollar a year kind of regular businesses, high profit. In many cases, no royalties involved because we owned them. Like like um, uh, Family Tree Maker, I think we owned without any royalty at all, and so on. And Print Shop, we had a very very low royalty on. So. Um, if you just looked at the company's profitability, Carmen was an internal product and so on. Um, those were increasingly the ones that were important to us and the, the games um, were a little less important. And so we had less entree, I think, into uh, the video game industry than we would have. Although uh, uh, Nintendo did once um, uh, ask if we'd be interested in doing productivity apps for the mm-hmm. Nintendo. And uh, we took a look at it. They had a bunch of ideas. Uh, they had a knitting machine they wanted software written for and so forth. And they wanted educational software, mostly as a sop in Japan to the politicians who didn't like what the kids were doing. And we eventually decided it was, they decided too, that, that, that it was not a good uh, uh, fit for their marketplace. And they right. didn't do any of that stuff. Right, that's, that's funny. So, well, um, I guess another question is, you know, nowadays there's this big push to preserve all of the the old software, and so people are frantically trying to copy discs and having to crack the 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 old software copy protection and everything. And just I'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts are, and like, you know, do you think is there value in in preserving these these old titles and well, for historic purposes, I think ours were all usually cracked while they were still in the market, and um, and there are emulators out there. I think almost every game that Bruder ever put out is available, though you don't always have the I.O. devices you need to operate them properly, joysticks and things like that. Um, as far as the original products, we gave them, I, I kept three copies of everything, and we gave a set of all of that, which was thousands of, of 
pieces of software to the Strong Museum of Play up in Rochester, New York, uh, for researchers and also a lot of our business documents and, and so forth. But the games themselves, and I, as I mentioned, I still have some Apple II computers. The games themselves don't stand up as well as our memories of them do. You know, they're a little crude. Um, it's kind of fun, for, but it's a walk down that nostalgia lane. It's not, uh, oh, this is a great game experience. Right. Um, and there are some exceptions to it, but the arcade games, that's particularly true. There are games, um, simulations, and things like that from that era that are still kind of fun to play because you don't depend on the graphics for them. So the original SimCity or Sid Meier's stuff and things like that still are very playable. Yeah. But Load Runner and Choplifter and so forth, you, you do it because you remember them fondly. You don't do it for very long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Even though I still can't rescue all the people in Choplifter <laughs> after all these years. Oh, so. well. <laughs> so, well, what about um, just kind of, you know, now there's there's also this whole retro uh, computing community and, you know, there people are, you know, including me, are still going to Kansas Fest every year. And um, does that kind of surprise you that that you know it's still so vibrant, or it's actually kind of had this revival? Or it's probably not highly visible to me. I, <laughs> I think I've I heard from John Romero about some some stuff that was going on yeah. um, uh, of that sort. I think I went to something once, but I didn't realize it happened regularly. This yeah. is the first I've heard still of Kansas Fest every year. Is that so, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now life moves on, and I can yeah. I've kind of done other things since then, and yeah. and uh, although I. I certainly remember the people of that time very fondly, and I, as I said, I've stayed in touch with hundreds of the Bruderbund community, yeah. and to a lesser extent, some of our competitors and so on, but they've mostly moved on too. Ken Williams, Ken and Roberta, I think, live in uh, Cabo San Lucas in Mexico, and Bob and Jan Davison retired and moved to Nevada somewhere, and it, you know, I, I know where some of them are, mm -hmm. and, and most of them, I, I honestly, I did stop in, uh, a few years ago when I was in Washington DC to look up Ken Wash, the executive director of the Software Publishers Association, which now has a different name, uh, but I missed him. Um, yeah. and, and so it's the only people, honestly, that I, that I know and stay in touch with, I know for other reasons, and they yeah. happen to have had a, a background in the right. early software industry. Right. Like, like I do so, still see um, uh, Al Tamervik and, and Margo, but they moved yeah. up to our neck of the woods, and right. so I occasionally see them. So I have a, actually a, a question from Jimmy Maher, who um, he actually used the the your archives at the, the Strong uh, Museum and did, did mm -hmm. a great big blog entry on uh, Bruderbund and its history and everything. Really, I should look it up. It's it's actually it's it's a wonderful article. Oh, okay. Um, but he actually so I, I was I was telling him I was going to talk to you, and he he said I had to ask you about a game called. Dark Heart of Ukrul, Ukrul, which apparently was a, a role-playing game, and it came from some developers from New Zealand or that's something. Right. Is that, that's right. So he wanted to know just what was the what was the story behind that? Like, how did that come about? Well, that that was a submission from two young men who are are now you know businessmen, insurance execs, or whatever. I I, I actually did contact them about five years ago just to find out what they were doing. I was mm -hmm. curious, and I tracked him down because one had an unusual name. His last name was Buis, I think, B-U-I-S or something like that. Anyhow, I was able to find one of the two and just talk to him and had, had not been in the software industry since he was a kid, since he was a teenager. Uh, I kind of forced that product into the channel because I loved it. I played it all the way through to the end. I thought it was really good. It had no sound, no audio, and I thought we had to add that. I couldn't get anybody else really excited about the game there, although Margot Tomrovic loved it. Margot Comstock yeah. lo loved it a lot. Um, and I do think that um, as a result of not being able to, to whip up enough enthusiasm inside the organization, they didn't add sound, which we normally did do, and they didn't do a lot of marketing or push behind it, and it didn't sell well. And they saw that as justification for not putting anything behind it, but of course it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's an extremely well thought out, well done, complex game with all kinds of, of hidden treasures built in it. You have to get deep yeah. into it to do it. Yeah. Well, he had nothing but glowing things to say about it. So it, oh, it's, good. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, well, so 
I can't think of any other specific questions I had. Is there anything else? Like, just, you know, if you wanted to say anything to the, I guess, either the retro gamers of today or just the, the people that used to read Soft Talk back in the day, just... Well, it was a it was a great time in all of our lives. I think we enjoyed one another immensely, and uh, I want to uh, express my continued thanks to Alan Margot for bringing us together in the way they did, and and for making such a huge difference in so many yeah. people's lives. Yeah, well, that's great. All right, well, thanks so much, Doug. No, my pleasure. So thanks, Doug, for that excellent interview. That was really informative and fun. And now going back to the magazine. I just wanted to show you one more example of the difference in advertising. So you remember earlier I showed you this image of the kind of hand-drawn advertisement for the speller and Q text, and then we'll contrast that with the eight-page spread from Sirius Software here. And this is the centerfold of the magazine. Uh, so Sirius Software really knew how to advertise their products, and these are just beautiful and really make you want to play all of these. Mm -hmm. Last thing, we come to the Soft Talk bestsellers, and lots of interesting things in here this month. So, strategy, you can see number one is actually Castle Wolfenstein, and number three is Robot War. So, Silas Warner had two in the top five for the strategy category. Then, moving on for adventure, we had High Res Adventure number three, Crankston Manor at number one. A soft porn at number two, so I guess the advertisement actually is working. Number three is Utopus by Mike Berlin of Sentient, soon to join up with Infocom. And then in fourth, we've got Zork. Down in Fantasy, there's some interesting things. So we've got Ultima at number one, but we've got Wizardry, which has just been released earlier this year, and that's crept up to number three. And it'll probably overtake Ultima in the coming months, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. And then on from there, oh look, there's an ad for Raster Blaster there, full page ad by Bill Budge. And then here we are in the top 30, and the top 30 this month is really interesting. So we've got VisiCalc at number one, but if you look at its index number there, which is kind of a relative ranking, it's got a ranking of 95. And the closest one after that is actually Raster Blaster, which is way down at 29. So VisiCalc was really outselling everything else at this time. And looking down the list, we've got a couple Bruderbund software. So we've got Apple Panic, and we've got Snoggle in there. So Snoggle, of course, is another kind of clone of an arcade game that really helped to put Bruderbund software on the map. Uh, a lot of actual kind of personal finance and self-help software here. So there's DB Master, PFS. Uh, then we've got some two from Sirius Software, Gorgon and Sneakers. And of course, here's Castle Wolfenstein down here at number 18. So that's about it for Soft Talk from November 1981. I hope you enjoyed all of the advertisements and the interview with Doug Carlston and we'll see you next month. Thanks for watching.